you. Hello, everyone. My name is Allison, and I'm an engineer at Robinhood. For those of you who don't know what is Robinhood, it's an app um, that allows you to trade stocks, and it's commission-free. So today, I'm going to talk about how we build a real-time anomaly detection system with InfluxDB. But before I dive into the story, I'd like to give um, a very short history of my first encounter with Influx. So that was two years ago, and I was still a student at CMU. And Paul, which is the, um, who is the founder for um, Influx Data, actually come to our school and gave this very fantastic talk about the time structure time structure merge tree, which is a storage system that's used in InfluxDB. And the talk is a series of time series database talk. And I vaguely remember that uh, in the talk, he mentioned something related to um, Influx 2.0 and Flux. So two years later, I'm very glad to see that everything that he mentioned earlier, two years ago, has become part of the actual system. And I, I couldn't say that Without InfluxDB, we wouldn't even be able to build a system in such a short period, period of time and be able to have the system running in production so well. So thanks a lot for everyone contribute to the InfluxDB project over here. All right, let's back to the talk. Um, <laughs> great, so the, the overview of the talk um, is I want to first talk about why we're building um, anomaly detections and what are the challenges that we're facing when we're considering um, the system that we're trying to build. And I will go over an algorithm that is um, pretty simple but very straightforward uh, to be able to detect anomalies. And third, I will be discussing why we ended up choosing InfluxDB as a time series database. And finally, I will go over, over how we build an end-to-end -end anomaly detection systems. Great, so why we are building a anomaly detection system from the first place. So imagine that you are a um, engineer or you are a um, operational um, people, person, and you're thinking about, okay, so there are so many business metrics over there, and um, how do I even find if something, um, something goes wrong? So you open the computer, staring at like tens or thousands of, or hundreds of different time series and 24 seven and see if there's anything that will run over the time series or anything that doesn't look right so that I can immediately figure out, oh, if there's any systems that exist that doesn't go well. But this doesn't seem to be a very practical or very scalable solution. As the number of time series uh, grow, you might find that the amount of effort that, that needs to actually understand or to actually detect anomaly in the time series becomes extremely, extremely, um, the cost is extremely high. So that is the, um, the reason why that we start to think about uh, maybe it's time to build a anomaly detection systems that can actually intelligently alert us when something doesn't go very well. And the very first solution that we come up with is the threshold-based alerting, which is a alerting um, that you set a, very, you set a fixed threshold, um, like here, the, over, the line over there. And whenever the underlying data is over or under the threshold, you alert. So this works pretty well with very simple time series. So for example, that you want to detect whether the amount of CPU utilization is over 80% or the amount of server that's currently running is over 100. But it failed to account for a little bit more complex time series. So in this case, as you might notice, that the time series here has a trend. It's trending upwards. And there are some patterns over there as goes up and down, goes up again and down again. And if you're going to set, use the fixed threshold to be able to alert a normally here, it doesn't work well because it will go over the threshold and you will get alerted, but then it will drop down the threshold and go over the threshold again. So it will be the same as checking the dashboard 24 seven. 
So the question here we, um, we ask is, how can we fix this problem? What are some ways that we can actually leverage the data in the past to be able to say that given a time series or given a incoming uh, data point, what will be a reasonable threshold to actually define the anomaly state? So here is a concept. Um, so we find this uh, from statistics called normal distribution, which the idea behind it is, um, so given a list of data, you can actually compute the mean, which is mu over here, and the standard deviation of the data point. And if we assume the data, the underlying data is normal, then we have 99.7% of, of confidence that the data will lie inside within the three times standard deviation um, of within the mean. So we can actually leverage the idea of normal distribution when we're detecting anomaly in the time series. So here is, um, here's how you can actually um, apply the idea of, um, of normal distribution into the anomaly detection over there. So think about if you have a stream of, stream of data coming in and we can bucket those data points uh, within a very small time interval. Let's say in this case, it's a minute. So we count, for example, we are counting the number of time, uh, number of data points coming in within the first minute and the second minute, which is 26, for example. And we're counting for the second and the third minute, and the third and fourth, and so on and so forth. So after we have a aggregation, we can actually use this aggregation and apply it to the data point that is over the past, for example, 30 days. So we calculate the, um, we get a list of um, aggregated data points for every day over the past 30 days uh, for every minute in the day. So that, and then we can utilize the, um, the time series that we aggregate to compute the mean and the standard deviation over the past 30 days and use that as a boundary for the time series um, threshold. And after we computing the threshold, we, whenever there's a, um, a new data point coming in, we can actually compare the number with the threshold and say that if the, um, the incoming, incoming data point is over the threshold or under the threshold, then we alert. So this is the, the idea behind um, anomaly detection using, um, using data in the past. So after we have this initial thoughts on how to detect anomaly in the system, the next step is to think about, okay, now we have a algorithm, how we can actually productionize it in, a, um, in, a, in our system so that we can actually build a intelligent system to alert without human looking at it. So what, what the system requirements are, including we need a database for fast time series aggregations and the ingestions in the real time. We also need a system to send these queries to the time series database and be able to identify and compute the anomaly in real time. And also we need um, other components of the system, including the visualizations and the alerting. Great, this is uh, my favorite part of the presentation, choosing a time series database. Here are a lot of time series database exist. And um, so for example, InfluxDB, Prometheus, Elasticsearch, OpenTSDB, Postgres, and a lot of them like over there. And why, so I want to dive very deep into why we actually ended up choosing um, InfluxDB as the time series um, when we're building the system. So first, InfluxDB is very lightweight. So lightweight here, um, I'm comparing it with um, the OpenTSDB, which is a database that's built on top of HBase, which requires um, the Hadoop ecosystem to be set up. But Influx, um, on the other hand, is actually very lightweight, where you don't actually require any third party or another system to set up in order to, um, to run in the production. You can literally just download, download it from a GitHub or run it in a Docker container, container 
and you can spin up a influx DB instance and be able to play around with it and see um, how it operates. So it's pretty lightweight compared to a lot of other databases that require, uh, for example, TSDB that require HBase as part of the, um, the underlying um, key value. And also it's um, schemaless. So Postgres, um, unlike a lot of um, relational database, uh, for example, Postgres, it's, so Postgres has a very strong schema where you need to define the schema beforehand before you can actually start to build a table and uh, ingest the data and be able to, for example, update the table. So InfluxDB in this case is uh, schemaless. So it doesn't require us to actually have a schema beforehand and which also reduce the, um, the, the overhead of us doing, for example, a schema migration, which actually make a lot of um, things pretty easy when we're um, handling in the production, where you can imagine that the data, um, the time series that is going to ingest, it has certain fields that can keep changing, and we don't need to actually uh, do a schema migration whenever the fields changes. So the third one is, um, is actually very critical too. Um, it's actually allowing us to index via a very specific field in the data. So I want to um, elaborate more on this point where, so you can imagine that there are time series data coming into the system and there are maybe multiple fields that contains the time series, um, contains the time. For example, a field called uh, created that or updated that or timestamped. And one of the requirements when we're building the system is that we need to index these time series um, using different, um, different timestamps that's presented in the, in the time series or in the original data point. So Prometheus in this case, it's more of a, for example, it's a push-based system where, you, where they have uh, exporters and whenever the exporters um, detect the data or export the data, it will be indexed into Prometheus, the time that is actually ingest into the database. So it's very difficult for us to actually using one of the field that's originally inside of the data se uh, time series to actually um, index the data into the time series database. So InfluxDB uh, allow us to do that by changing the, um, the time column so that it can be actually very easy for us to use which to, to say that which, which field that we want to use to actually index the data into the data time series database. And also, it allows very fast data ingestion, which is writing, and aggregation, which is reading. So this is uh, also another very, um, very, very strong requirement when we're thinking about uh, which time series database to use. Because you can imagine that if you're going to run in a real-time system, it will require a lot of ingestion of the upstream data in real time, as well as you need to query a lot of things out of that database in real time. So we need a database that can actually do the ingestion and aggregation um, in the same time, and it's going to be, and it can be very last latency. So Elasticsearch in this case, um, it has a very good reading speed, but compared to um, InfluxDB, uh, within our like our business use case, um, it's actually um, have a larger overhead when you want to ingest the data and aggregate it in the same time. And also, um, it is InfluxDB is um, apparently fault tolerant if you are using the enterprise version which is absolutely another requirement when we're thinking about building a system because we don't want a one server that crashed and then the entire database will crash. And also, it is a very awesome influx data stack, which actually just gave us everything we need when we're constructing the, um, the system. It has capacitor, which can be used for alerting. It has chronograph, which can be used to explore the data and to um, plot the different time series on top of InfluxDB. And it also has Telegraph, which is a, um, a agent that you can actually send the time series data from different source to InfluxDB. And finally, it has uh, 
very incredible community, and we can have a lot of answer questions answered, and there's a it's pretty incredible community in the GitHub over there, as you can see. Great. So that is the very big first part of, um, of choosing a time series database when we're trying to do anomaly detections. Then the second part is after we have this database, we actually need a system to actually query the data out of the database so that we can compute the, the mean and the standard deviation then how can we do that? So here is a system that we use for real-time stream processing. And it's actually open sourced by, uh, by Robinhood. It's called Faust. And you can think, think about it as a, um, as a Python version of Kafka stream where it has, um, it is pretty performant because it utilizes the, um, the async IO, like Python 3 async IO um, format and is fault tolerant. And it's also scalable because it depends on the, um, so the underlying structure for that is Kafka. And I, wouldn't, I, I won't dive very deep into the architecture or the system behind Faust, but I, w I do want to show that the function that we leverage um, using Faust to, to be able to, um, to send the query to InfluxDB and get data back is called a timer over there. And so what this timer does is actually very similar to how capacitor is doing the, um, the aggregation or anomaly detection. It's actually, so we have an interval which represents what is the frequency uh, for this task to run. And whenever, um, so we will actually schedule a lot of tasks. And whenever the schedule interval reaches, it will, actu it will actually execute this function for example, here, we, instead of um, hello.send, we can say influxdb.query, and which will actually query the, query the influxdb, construct the query, and give us the time series data that we need to be able to detect anomalies. So this is a, um, a diagram of how we combine Faust with influxdb. So you can see it here. It's, so we utilize the, um, the Faust agent and utilize the timer function over there to continuously send queries to InfluxDB, which returns us the data point. And we can compute the, the mean and standard deviation and compare the, um, the pre-computed pre threshold within and compare the threshold with the actual data point that we ingest. And if either we find it's outside of the range, we can send that results um, to back to Kafka, which can in turn be ingested back to InfluxDB and using, um, and can be alerted um, with capacitor. So let's talk about the actual data ingestion part. So the, the, way, that, um, the way that we, um, we ingest data into InfluxDB is by utilizing um, Logstash and Telegraph. So we're actually using Logstash because we already um, have that piece of infrastructure set up. But I would say that Telegraph will serve the same purpose over there. So, a lot of, so we have a lot of time series um, inside of, um, of Kafka, which is a stream processing, is a pub sub stream processing um, engine or serv service. And in order to um, be able to move this time series data to InfluxDB, we actually need um, a service to connect these two services together. So Logstash or Telegraph is a, um, is a, you can think about that as a connector where it has a input plugin where you can specify which Kafka topic I'm going to ingest or consume from. And it can do certain transformations and output to um, InfluxDB and specify which field that you want to be indexed. For example, I can specify it to be updated at or created at, depending on the use case. Great, here is the visualization piece. And we actually have both uh, Grafana and Chronograph um, in our production system. So Chrono uh, Grafana is uh, primarily used to build a dashboard that can also combine, for example, um, data that we query from different time series database. So it's more of a, um, a I would say a, um, a dashboard that covered, that has a coverage of multiple, uh, multiple time, time series database 
and you will be able to um, create visualizations and put them together under the same dashboard. And we also have Chronograph uh, deployed in uh, production, and it's primarily used for uh, very quick data uh, visualization or exploration, and so that we can actually using the click and uh, click, click and drop, we can actually build a very sophisticated um, InfluxDB query um, by in a minute. So those are pretty good visualizations. And here is a, um, a result of building the entire system and deploying them in production. So, I, so here you can see that the orange or the yellow line is actually the actual data that we aggregated. And the blue shades over there represent the upper bound and the lower bound of the time series. And since the, so here the, um, the aggregation is actually by minute. So each individual point over here is the amount of data that we have um, over the past minute. And you can see here um, on the very right hand side, there's a yellow dot, which represents something abnormal happened and we want to be able to alert on that. So this is actually created entirely with Grafana which has a very cool feature called you can, um, you can actually draw the shape within a boundary. So whenever you ship a data to, um, to Kafka and you include the actual, actual data, the boundary point in Grafana, you can actually visualize everything and you will look at, look at this. Great, so after we identify the anomaly, we want to be able to alert on the downstreams. And here we leverage the, um, the, the service called uh, Capacitor, which um, I'm pretty sure that everyone here is uh, pretty familiar with Capacitor. It's a um, alerting engine that allow you to define, um, define the rule based on, a, um, based on text script and be able to alert and configure what are the downstream services that you want to actually receive the alert. So we use Oxygenie for, um, for for very serious alerts and Slack for a status update. So here is a overall um, high level system architectures. So we have time series data in Kafka and it get ingested um, through Logstash into InfluxDB and the Grafana will be connected to InfluxDB and we'll be able to visualize the time series and we use Capacitor as an alerting service and the Faust application to actually compute and determine whether the incoming data point is abnormal or not. Cool. So this, so one of, so the, um, the alerting or the, the anomaly detection algorithm that I just mentioned is apparently just one of the very, like one of the small amount of, of of the algorithms that you can actually use to detect anomalies. So here, I actually look into the, um, the actual capacitor's anomaly detection library, which seems pretty cool. And InfluxDB also has a hot winters function, and it's not about global warming. And I, I believe that t um, tomorrow we will have a, a in-depth talk about, um, about how to utilize this function over there. And the, uh, another aspect I want to mention is that since we are using the, um, the Faust, which is built on top of Python, we can actually leverage a lot of machine learning libraries when we're trying to detect anomaly here. So we can import scikit-learn, import NumPy, import pandas, or if you want to be very fancy, import um, PyTorch or TensorFlow and deploy deep learning algorithms using LSTM which is actually doable because you can, for example, train the model, upload it to S3, and when the service is starting, you pull the model from S3, and using the exact same mechanism to query the data from InfluxDB, and compare the actual data with the data that's predicted by the model. And using the same, same mechanism to, to send it the, um, the detection results to Kafka, and be able to alert the downstream. So the conclusion here is the entire system is very lightweight and thanks to InfluxDB and InfluxStack, 
we'll be, we, are, we were very lucky to be able to build a system in a very short period of time. And it's incredibly extensible in a case where you can utilize this system and the change to use different, different kinds of anomaly de detections based on your, um, your business needs. And it is also horizontally scalable because here you can see that each piece over there is actually horizontally scalable, which means if the load of the system increases, you can add more servers to the system and it can actually tackle the, the problem of increasing load. So Kafka is a, um, is, um, is a cluster and Logstash is also clustered and InfluxDB is also fault tolerant and highly available and the files app the same. So the entire structure over here um, is horizontally scalable and it won't run into the issue where you have a hundred times more time series and the system won't be, at, be able to handle the load. So that's, um, that's the, um, the end of the presentation and thank you um, for listening to the talk. I'm sure you have some time for questions. So, any questions from the audience? Uh, the microphone's coming away. It's being run there. There we go. Delivered on time. So, uh, uh, Chronograph and uh, Grafana, they have a lot of overlaps. And I'm just wondering how you guys decide which piece of the information goes to Chronograph and which piece goes to uh, Grafana. And further, how do you instruct your engineers who are looking at those information to go to the right place? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so I think, so one, one consideration is that, um, so Grafana is more of a visualization that you can have multiple database underlines, right? So if, if, the, if you're, if, you're um, if for example, that you utilize um, not only just InfluxDB, but also there are other time series running in the system, for example, Prometheus, for example, Elasticsearch. Um, Grafana would be a better choice because you can actually plot the, um, the visualizations with different, time, with different um, time series database underneath it. And you can actually pull these visualizations into um, one dashboard. So you have one dashboard, but with uh, multiple pieces um, getting into the dashboard altogether where Chronograph is more specifically for InfluxDB, and it can be actually used by, um, so what we find it very, very, uh, very useful in a way where you can just click the, um, the exact time series and be able to construct the entire visualizations um, in less than 30 seconds. So it's actually very, very useful when you're trying to just play around with it and see how the, um, how the time series looks like. And it's also actually very helpful to onboard people to understand how to write a time series or influx QL. So I think they, are, they have um, very different use cases over there. So we, we primarily use Chronograph to quickly construct a time series while using um, Grafana. If we, have, uh, we, if we need to build the dashboard um, that combines the data from multiple databases. So uh, how InfluxDB as a single unit scales horizontally? Um, you mean how uh, InfluxDB scales? Itself, itself, not the log stash, not the other units. So whether InfluxDB as a single piece can be clustered? You mean the, oh, I see. So the InfluxDB itself, if you are using, I remember, um, if you're using the, um, the open source version, is actually one instance. And I remember there are um, some, uh, some discussion in the community where you can actually make it um, highly available. So you can actually implement some of the logic yourself to actually make it um, fault tolerant. But I'm not actually sure how, um, how, how you be able to do that step by step. Great. Thank you so much, Alison. Really, really appreciate that. Thank you.